Hello, my friends. This is Deepak again, and uh, we are continuing our series on conversations with luminaries, influencers, philosophers, scientists, and anyone who's making a difference in the world. And today, uh, my wonderful guest is someone whom I've come to know recently, but an amazing philanthropist, uh, an amazing influencer, a luminary by any standard. Uh, his name is Don Katz, and he was founder of Audible as well. So welcome uh, to this conversation, Don. What a pleasure to be with you, Deepak. Thank you. You know, uh, a lot of our audience is seeing you for the first time. And so uh, I usually start by asking people to uh, tell me a little bit about their family, their childhood, where they grew up, what their influences were and how they got to be to this point where you are right now. So it's all yours. Well, I'm a, I'm a lucky uh, person in so many ways. My, uh, my life has been pretty much defined as an adult by two careers. I was an author and a writer for 20 years coming out of, uh, of, of school and becoming uh, actually the Rolling Stone magazine correspondent in London in the 1970s covering wars and revolutions. And I was really the program correspondent. And I had a wonderful career. I wrote books I'm very proud of. Um, and um, believe it or not, in the middle of, uh, of this level of significant success, uh, and I look back at this as just the gift of that kind of a life is you get ideas. And then you're able to turn those ideas into reality. You have a vision for a book that should exist or a long article or a truth to be exemplified, particularly since I wrote in a storytelling mode that became very well known for Rolling Stone, this concept of journalistic narrative prose that was actually true. And I had a wonderful run doing that. And I was, uh, as a long form magazine writer or a book writer, uh, uh, doing doing quite well and then at the age of 43 i started a company and uh my wife tends to call this a non-toxic midlife crisis um and weirdly um audible being what became the next phase of my life um it there's a lot of data now that shows that people who are around 43 who start companies entrepreneurs have a much higher success rate than people uh, who are more like 22, because you think of the, you know, the, the dropout from school or the, you know, the, the very young, um, you know, entrepreneurs is driving particularly technology-driven businesses. But I was supposed to write a book about how the digital digitization of the uh, of the of the society, the economy, and civilization in general would be changed um, by the advent of these new technologies and network systems and things like that, and it was. It was too academic a subject for me, and I ended up learning more and more about emerging technologies. Now, we're talking the mid-1990s. This was when the internet was just an idea around the phone lines and a military system of communication. Um, and I became, I changed my column, which was an Esquire magazine, which was the business column for years throughout the 80s. I sort of thought my job was to teach my fellow baby boomers about things they didn't know about, money being one of them, which a lot of us had assiduously avoided uh, even knowing about it given our counterculture kind of background. And I, and I began to understand technology at a much deeper level. And as part of that, I began to tell people in 1994, 1995, that people would be walking around with little digital devices in their pockets, which held the sound of civilization. And literally, I've never come up with a thought, as crazy as some of my thoughts have been, that more people thought I was out of my mind around. And, and I said, no, no, it's, it's, it's literally, there's, there's miniaturization of components of devices. There are these new networks that eventually will be able to send, um, believe it or not, movies and things through the, this new, these new internet-based networks. And, um, and since everybody told me I was kind of crazy being me, I, I just got more focused on it. And I broke off and started Audible in 1995. And we went on to invent the first digital audio player, the first 
way of downloading content, the first way of securing intellectual property on the internet way before other words for this, like digital rights management, like, you know, were from existence. And Audible um, became a company and I became the founder and the CEO and uh, we launched the actual service in 1997, which was five years before the iPod came out. That little device is in the Smithsonian now is the first network digital audio player. And, um, and from there, uh, I have watched and been part of Audible becoming a very large company with tens of millions of people listening as as we speak to the to the audio we we present to them. It's been an amazing adventure, but uh, it allows me to uh, report that uh, you can actually have two careers turning ideas into uh, into realities. And uh, and here at this point in my life, uh, um, I'm still not, I still tend to move forward as I know you do too, Deepak. But um, but uh, every so often when I do reflect, it's been quite an amazing. Uh, Know, dual career experience. I came from Chicago, Illinois. I was very much uh, marked by my times. I was there during Chicago's experience of both the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, uh, um, which, and I was very involved with uh, urban inequality from that point and being focused on what was going on in different parts of the, the city I grew up in. There was, um, I was very formed by having the Democrats in, you know, running the city being not progressive in any way. And in fact, they were kind of the, you know, the, the racists and the, um, and in many ways, you know, quite murderous as, as history would show. So I was very much formed by, um, you know, a politicized childhood. I had a, a fantastic father who was a highly intellectual, also a World War II hero who died when I was 19, which had a lot to do with my, you know, my, my experiences. It actually, there's a lot of studies that show that entrepreneurs often have fatherlessness in their background, either through death or abandonment. Um, and uh, and I, uh, uh, it was it was it was a really you know fascinating child that I went on to study uh, at different universities, including University of Chicago and Stanford and NYU. At NYU, I was taken under the wing of someone who became a formative mentor for me for both my careers, who was the great novelist Ralph Ellison. And uh, he, I guess, saw something in me, which I think followed this was, was part of it for him too, and, uh, and became a really important part of, of my life as, a, as one of those teachers who changed me and probably enabled me to be a writer and is very much the voice in my head for Audible. I mean, Ralph was a, a deep student of um, the American vernacular in particular. So I always knew that American literature in particular was a, the way Mark Twain wrote or Stephen Crane wrote. There was a function of how we talked and bragged and told come stories around campfires in this polyglot culture. We stopped writing like Brits very early. Um, and uh, I was always okay with that and I knew that the sound of literature had an intellectual integrity when most of my peers who were literary writers thought text was the thing. So um, so Ralph is memorialized all over um, Audible's uh, now significant footprint around the world, particularly in our headquarters in Newark and the fact that he was not only one of our greatest writers but a, but a black writer um, was also extremely important to me. So I had the great gift of, uh, of that kind of a mentor. And then I went on and I lived in England and uh, went to the London School of Economics. And so I had another interesting perspective, as you know well, um, by not having a monolithic American view of, of the times and society. So I had a, a, a lot of great experiences that I think formed me as, um, in many ways, not your typical, I'll just say it, soup. <laughs> so, which is fine with me, uh, but I, I, I have a pretty unusual profile for a, a, a long time, you know, CEO of a, of a now large corporation. Well, that's 
fascinating. <clears throat> I see actually multiple careers, not only writer and uh, founder of Audible, but philosopher and philanthropist. And I want to get to some of those uh, issues uh, about your life as well. Some of those revelations that are quite amazing and make a difference in the world. But I want to start with a couple of things because I love, loved your uh, phrase is turning ideas into reality and the sound of civilization. Since you have an interest in philosophy, <clears throat> right now, as you know, the, the prevailing conversation in philosophy right now, if you go on Google and you type out, uh, what are the 125 unexplained or open questions in science, which pertain to philosophy as well. The number one, um, thing that pops up if you Google this is Science Magazine, uh, 2006 or eight, I don't know when, but it hasn't changed. Number one question is, what's the universe made of? And the shortest answer you can get is, it's made of nothing. And then the number two question is, um, uh, what's the basis of consciousness? What's the biological basis of consciousness? And that's even harder. If the universe is made of nothing, then why does it look like you and me and the furniture behind us and the Milky Way galaxy and rainforests and humans and objects and animals. And this is referred to as the hard problem of consciousness because um, right now as we are speaking to each other and we are hearing sound and so is everybody else who's watching us and listening to us, there's no sound in the brain. Um, in fact, there's no sound in the world. Uh, you know, there is no such thing as an unheard sound. You know that famous phrase, what uh, does a tree falling in the forest sound like if no one's there to hear it? And I think everybody agrees that sound is not an attribute of the physical universe, period. It's a modification of consciousness, but um, it's true of all our senses. So, you know, right now, as you're looking at me and I'm looking at you and people are looking at the screen and looking at themselves and looking outside the windows at the world, there is no image in the brain. No, all there is, same thing as when you hear sound, electrochemistry. And even electrochemistry is an experience in awareness. So, you know, we are now beginning to understand that the five senses, the confederation of the five senses, which we can't explain, somehow produces the appearance of a physical world with objects, trees, people, cars, automobiles, and music, and everything that we can possibly think of comes from this domain which has no form, and yet we are experiencing form and phenomena. And particularly sound, which is so fascinating because, you know, if you look at the philosophical traditions of the East, they say uh, the first experience that consciousness has is sound. Um, and then other things follow. Sensations follow, images follow, tastes follow, smells follow. And then we start making, you know, uh, inferences around these experiences. And we literally end up constructing the notion of a mind, a body, an ego, and a physical world. It's just a notion. And it's a human notion constructed out of a very narrow band of perceptual activity, which is uniquely human. I mean, you, the, what does the world look like to an insect with a hundred eyes? We have no idea. Or a bat that moves through the echo of ultrasound? No idea. Or a snake that navigates through infrared? No idea. Or uh, or a chameleon whose eyeballs swivel on two different axes. Uh, I can't even remotely imagine what the screen would look like to a chameleon. So what's the picture of the world? What's the sound of it? There's no such thing. It's how we construct it. So for me, the very idea that you tapped into the sound of civilization is the genius that was behind Audible. Whether you explored the hard problem of consciousness or not, you somehow figured out that the sounds we hear, which are noises, I mean, this is a noise. 
And that's all it is. Now we've given it meaning, so we have language. And we are the only species who has narrative language. And so we picked up another genius idea. The sounds of civilization could be used to tell stories. And that's who we are as human beings, storytellers. To be human is to have a story. So first of all, thanks for your genius. Wow, well, thank you for taking my idea to a much higher level than I probably no, could have. Thanks for your genius. <laughs> you turned ideas into reality. And you tapped into an amazing phrase, the sounds of civilization. And well, everything has followed that. Uh, did video so come... Look, I, I've said for forever, I didn't read the way other people read. I heard every word I ever read, and it really reminded me of music. I was so taken by the syncopations. Most really writers who are, get literary prizes and stuff I know were very slow readers. Um, they weren't fast readers. The fast readers who can take things in and speed read and everything tended to become reporters you know, at, at newspapers. They didn't tend to write at length. And I was just, my first career, I, I cared so much about what I called the music and language. And, um, and I would hear it. And I think when Audible started, I also became aware of what is it about that straight shot to the emotions of music that seems to bypass, to some extent, the, the more cerebral interactions that language and words uh, inspire. And I remember thinking that I think this, the way people would use a service that allowed stories to be read to them, which I knew would hark back to a childhood sense of happiness. I mean, in, in many ways, there's a lot of definition of a, of, a, of a great childhood, of being read to and told stories. And, the, and a deprived child that often is characterized, which I know more about now because of our other work, by not having these things read to you. So I knew that being read to could be, in, in, in a, and I used the word seductive intimacy, because most of the performances for Audible are private. You're alone in a car. You're alone in this world created by a, you know, a sonic sanctum by, by headphones. And, um, and it took a while to kind of prove it, but it was proven out consistently that it, there's something to it um, by both the addiction of the service from people who've been with us for all these years, just listen, and they index huge numbers of hours per week to, to listening, but also even by you know, um, neurological testing, one, one in the University of London, the heavy duty neuronal testing of how the emotive lobes of the brain are lit up by oral storytelling, by our kind of content, more than watching movies. So they would do head to head of the same kind of scenes, you know, the same, and then you have to listen and without the eyes to kind of mitigate the, the purity of the emotional power, um, you are getting things that to me are more like the way certain strains of music seem to cut through, you know, and touch some primordial sensibility, you know, and emotion. But I was really, I mean, I'd almost like to go offline and just talk to you for hours about what you just said, because it is at another plane. And I assume what you were saying is why, you know, spiritual leadership often is called for silence as kind of a predicate of deeper, you know, meditative uh, introspection. But, um, but for Audible, it, it was kind of like you said, I just thought, you know, there's this interactive squawking in people's lives called the radio. And what if this became, you know, and I used to say to people who wouldn't want, you know, Colin Firth uh, to read them a story while they sat in traffic, one of the least productive ways of spending time and also one of the most stressful parts for people. And, um, you know, I, I always thought that if we could figure out the technology of easily getting um, your choice of what to listen to, particularly if it's profound and, and moving and important. And, uh, and what I did at the beginning was just said, there's hardly any audio books. There were hardly any. And um, there were a few thousand when I started. Um, what if you could take the best writing and position it as a script and then inspire someone to perform that, not in a histrionic way, but in a way that was appropriate to this 
no look aesthetic, you know, this idea of listening only. And over the years, um, we just had a lot of success, uh, you know, making that happen. And then more recently, um, we have literally thousands of creators who can write or perform, figuring out how to make this new format even more creative, like writing to the actual aesthetic. We just call it an audible aesthetic, which is this, um, and it's it's something of a challenge for people who come from the pure literary textual view. And it's also a challenge for people who let's say write movies, which are really maps to, 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 to physical action, to literally have this uh, have ability to just, you know, shut down the, um, you know, the, 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 the eyes and force this one sense of listening and what, you know, what those, the, but as you say, it's storytelling. Uh, let me tell one, you know, anecdote. So early on, um, Audible is just really mu much of a dream and it's the um, end of the 1990s. And uh, I, I had this idea that shorter form original programming, which later became the word podcast, which is eight years later or something, uh, you know, would be something that we would develop. And I was sitting with Robin Williams in San Francisco and basically trying to convince him to be part of, of this adventure. Um, and this is when he was entirely at the top of his game and making whatever, $15 million for a movie. And, um, and I tried to tell him that you will have, it won't be like stand-up where you're in a crowd or you're creating a crowd experience stuff. It'll be you, your voice will be literally inches from the brain pan of these people. And you will basically own that experience in a, in a way. And he's jumping around saying, I'm going to be in there blanking the ears and, you know, doing this kind of Robin thing. And in part of this, he, uh, his mentor, who was a great American comedian, Jonathan Winters, who was really kind of a mad genius of comedians of the generation before Robin kind of came into the picture. And he said, uh, Robin, you have to work with Audible. And Robin said, well, why do I have to? He says, because you don't know if you're really funny anymore because he said your physical shtick has taken over your act. And he said, this is Winters, when we left vaudeville and went to radio, we found out who was truly funny. And it was kind of one of those moments where, and he went on to do original programming for us again, years before, you know, the word podcast kind of came into, uh, you know, into being, but it was, it was one of those things where there was something particularly about the, at least if not the spiritual, at least the artistic capacity to create a different kind of voice uh, that was really inspirational uh, from the beginning of, of Audible. And we're evolving, at, you know, all the time. And uh, I mean, you know, having, having your incredible voice on our platform alone is a, is a huge milestone, you know, for us because, um, what we do find too is that millions and millions of people come to us because they do want to live a better life. I mean, that's part of it. And it's a huge area of, of, uh, of a sort of addictive growth. And uh, the better we can be at that, the better we'll serve all these listeners. Well, the phrase, first there was the word and the word was made into flesh comes to mind <laughs> which is everywhere all over the uh, spiritual literature of the world it's the word the word was with god and the word was made into flesh and everything else followed so let me ask you a question you know i meditate every day and uh, as soon as i may, i close my eyes i hear a voice it's me talking to myself and uh, of course as I said before, the hard problem says there's no sound in the brain. So who's talking to whom? And uh, that is the whole issue uh, by itself. But I hear a voice and then suddenly the words translate into images and other experiences. So, you know, if the word is strawberry, I see a strawberry and I taste a strawberry in my awareness all happens by itself. The word kind of entangles with every other experience and just a word. I mean, if I say rainbow, just a word. If I say love, 
just a word. I mean, I, I say love, I think of my mother, I smell her skin. I remember sitting on her lap. I uh, have fond memories and um, I feel her presence, just the word love. I mean, it's remarkable that you can take a word and then weave it into a tapestry of sentences, paragraphs, stories, epics, and uh, the history of civilization since the beginning of time. All begins with a word. So let me ask you uh, a question. First of all, did the audio technology soup come after the digital visual technology or before or simultaneously? Well, no, the, in many ways, the audio technology led a particular element of the technological changes, which was because in the world of the internet, having no imagination of, a, of broadband, and it was on the phone line, you could only fit so much through the pipe. So it is true that the textual conveyance of, of bits was a little bit ahead. In other, in other words, you could, you could get um, uh, a basic email or a small text file, and then you could print it out. So you had some level of of Ethernet-based connection. But when I realized that you could compress the audio signal and still fit it through the phone lines, that led me to thinking that um, there was something here uh, and it was, um, and it could relate to, frankly, all of the 13 city book tours I went on when there weren't any books. You know, you get to Portland and you do AM Portland and you work, in my case, five and six years on a book. And there's no books, but it was really that. So really, much more of a business calculus. Like, well, what if you could shoot these books through through the internet? You would never be out of stock. You'd never be out of print. All those things that I lived with as making a living as a you know as a writer. So, but it was early. Um, uh, and then, of course, at that point, though, literally nobody could even imagine that full spectrum music or video, whatever, it fit into the kind of pipes we have. Now it just wasn't uh, broadband was uh, was a distant dream in the mid nineties. Uh, the other thing that happened was component miniaturization was happening. So digital signal processes were getting smaller. Flash memory was a new invention, which was a magnetic. So I knew these things partly because the great luck of having a college roommate who was a supercomputer designer, who was my friend, so I could bounce these ideas off him, and also he used my journalistic position to learn at a high level. I mean, one of the great things about being a journalist is you could go find the, uh, you know, the actual, uh, <laughs> you know, experts in the world and the real, the real folks and uh, learn from them. I often say that being an inquiring journalist is one of the best backgrounds for a startup entrepreneur um, because you have to be so honest about what you don't know and then you have to find it out and supplement it with, with expertise and gather that around you. Um, but most of my brethren in the world of, of making books and articles were so basically anti-capitalist that none of them would have considered jumping into a, a private sector <laughs> endeavor. So, so I'm sorry, I did take up. What, what was the question? I'm excited to hear. No, no, you answer the question. You answer the question very elegantly and eloquently. Um, you know, I've become a fan now of Audible and all the podcasts and amazing stuff that you produce your company produces and uh, it's almost uh, you know some of the stuff i hear is cinematic with music and scenes and you know all i'm closing my eyes and i'm experiencing a world not just through sound but through every sense that i have so that is the remarkable uh, achievement of audible right now in the world that it gives you such a visceral experience visceral experience through yeah. sound and it's not just sound it's, it translates into you know i'm a student of synesthesia some people hear a word and they taste something or they taste something it translates into a word or a sensation or an experience to how our senses are entangled as modifications of our being is what has fascinated me over the years but Audible is actually proving, in a sense, that there's no hard problem, that the physical world actually is a manifestation of the word entirely, totally. And for me, that is, you know, for, that's been a revelation of mine for a long time. But 
not not something that people understand that everything begins with consciousness vibrating and that vibration humans have translated into the experience of sound and stories but then humans have also translated that into visceral experiences of every possible sensation and audible listening to a podcast proves that i mean as soon as i listen to a podcast with a storyline or whatever it's a visceral experience of all the five senses even though my eyes are closed i see images i feel sensations there are perceptual activities happening there is a story that is being orchestrated with not only syntax and humor and you know grammar but actually it's a story that is being projected on the screen of my consciousness through all the five senses that is remarkable so that you can cinematic audio is something we we've, we've talked about for a long time where you're literally painting more vivid pictures by allowing the mind to create you know, almost a better image than the you know more passive art like you know photography was always thought to be passive versus painting in the old school because you know because it was capturing a reality the photographers wouldn't agree with that but you know it was different than the, the pure form of painting um, but we're trying to unleash the most creative people from all walks of life we have a huge program in theater for instance because theater writers working with a smaller box were less dependent on the visuals and were able to project in some ways to the um, to this oral you know, aesthetic in, in a different way but being able to be experimental and, and unleash so many different talents we have a fantastic program called words and music but we've gone to the greatest musicians and you have them james taylor's piece yo-yo ma's new piece it's just where you basically say to them we want a 90 minute story we want something that you know or believe it don't just describe your music to us and then punctuate it with your music so the narrative arc and you and the just just listen to some of them i mean there's there's so many that you know from from virtuoso rockers like tom morello to to cheryl crow to others who have something to say um that transcends just you know i i met i met this lady in abilene texas and here's a song i wrote about her it was just just by saying you have a different intellectual opportunity. You can't believe the impact of creativity that we're able to draw out. And, and the truth is, that since Audible, there, it's not like most businesses are, are actually um, technical improvements on processes that already exist. They're usually productivity improvements, whether it's everything about software or Uber is literally still a way to get as, as a rickshaw once did from here to here, or a taxi did, it's just better. And that's really what makes a lot of, um, of business happen. But there really wasn't a, an audio listening category that took in business. And it was, it should have been a mainstream American business type because of our vernacular storytelling tradition. And in fact, you know, as you probably know, with Audible Suno in India, talk about a storytelling culture where you have the entire Hindi intellectual class being much more of a verbal storytelling society, much more so than a textually oriented, you know, society. Um, and um, to be able to unleash that into these other societies that aren't necessarily book oriented cultures, whether you have a profound storytelling tradition in Japan, it's very different than, you know, the, the more English and American um, focus on what was the text and book culture that really reached its apogee in the 19th century. It's been a bit of a battle ever since, but there's all sorts of interesting things that we got to play in having to do also with class, who should read. It's very much a, 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 an element imposed by, by elites <laughs> on others. The, you know, the American public library system was a reaction to the fact that only rich people were supposed to read until well into the 20th century. The paperback book was rejected as a denigration of the purity of the leather bound book. It didn't exist because it would let people who weren't supposed to be reading into it. So anyways, there's, there's so many interesting historical, spiritual, psychological strains that make you know the ideas behind what I did. I, I did want to say though, that one of the things that's been the core to my 
you know, my joy and also I think by my success is that when I was a writer, I used to center myself on what does something really mean? What does it mean to die for a cause? Not just reporting that there's a, a war of which there were many I covered in the, in the 70s, which people forget how many there, there were, um, but what does it mean to be willing to, or being told to leave Cuba to fight a proxy war in Angola or, or Somalia? What is that, or why would middle-class people in Italy become part of the Brigate Rosa, the Red Brigade, and literally go and become murderers of the grandparental generation? I, I was always like, what does it mean? Um, and then when I got to Audible, I always said to myself, as soon as we're successful, I want to explore what a company can mean in ways that transcend what it does. Because after a point, you can say what a company does in spreadsheets. It's kind of why they exist, <laughs> you know? And that's very different. And, um, and I think that that, as long as they're, I'm, I'm still the founder and I'm the executive chairman now of a fantastic CEO, um, I'm trying to continue to have those ideas, those visions of the possible, um, still motivate our days. And I think um, it certainly makes it a lot more fun to work for a, a business if, uh, if ideas and, uh, and, and search for meanings. And that led to a lot of the work we do in terms of particularly addressing urban inequality and other things and trying to be a little different than corporations who tend to expiate their guilt through uh, usually um, undirected giving to charity. Well, you know, what I'm experiencing by listening to Audible is that and I'm realizing that each of us constructs our own world just listening to those words. And it's unique. It's not it, yours. It's not mine. We may have leaky margins in terms of experience, but we're constructing our own world listening to those words. words. Let me, uh, because we might soon run out of time, I want to know a little bit about your philanthropy right now, your kitchens in New Jersey, what inspired you to do that? Uh, can you share a little bit? Yeah, so under the ages of what can a company mean that transcends what it does, uh, uh, again, I think I mentioned that I was always a reader and a student of the profundity of urban inequality and racial inequality in particular, partly because of just the way I was educated, being from Chicago, knowing of these deep disparities, reading philosophers like James Jacobs, The Life and Death of the Great American City. When it came out in 1971, it sort of amazes some of my young employees, who basically be my grandchildren. But uh, I, um, I, I ended up uh, seeing the city of New York, New Jersey as reminding very, very much of the south side of Chicago and places that I knew because it was deeply mired in, in levels of deprivation and inequality, uh, despite it being literally tethered minutes from your city. Um, and I, I, I became very, very interested in 25 years ago in things that were work and not work in terms of ameliorating inequality and, and poverty. Um, and I saw just decades of ineffectual action, maybe well intended. Um, and at one point, just basically said, let's move the company out of time. And that was the first thing we decided to do. And we did various things that, um, that were designed to uh, at least learn in a direct way. Because what happens is that since the 80s, um, even won the economic wars of, of what the moral underpinnings of, a, of an institution that's private you know, actually are, um, most people have just set up a small group and given money to nonprofits that ask for it as opposed to using the kinds of measurement and impact analyses that got them the money to give away. Irony, that's fairly consistent. Um, and so we moved in and basically we, we said first, no more paid internships unless you're uh, someone who's from Newark or educated in Newark. And this brought some of the most amazing people right out of Martin Luther King's content of character, a concept. To the world. So meanwhile, we're becoming the largest employer of actors in the York area. We have all these rocket scientists, technologists from all over the world. Um, we have, you know, all these English majors like me turned into business people. And these incredible kids from Newark working with us. Culture is just brimming with, um, with 
intensive of, of uh, a loan that, you know, reminded me of my days for going to the bank to be pure and bringing the culture with something different. It's such a special feeling that you don't get if you're working at a company that's been there before you were born and it's going to be there you know, after, you, after you die. So it was really exciting. Um, and we began seeing then that, you know, how uh, students became uh, scholars in college. We supported them there. We wanted to get them to come back because of their fantastic educations and the like. We began to, I began to get involved with the economic development uh, institutions, including chairing the local economic development corporation. You began to see that um, policies from the past were, were hurting along with some of the structural characteristics of racism, which now is much more public and known to others in the last year in particular. Um, but beyond that, you saw that you know, retaining old corporations that aren't growing versus actual job growth. Um, we, had, we had 12 people move to, uh, from Munich to Berlin about 14 years ago. And Berlin was the poorest city in Central Europe, very much inequality everywhere, uh, a blighted city for historical injuries in many ways, but it changed and it was a very equitable comeback, uh, providing jobs at all levels, the tech um, driving it to some extent because the tech businesses rub off so many different jobs at all levels. There's a lot of academic demographic analysis on this. So we did things like we uh, started Newark venture partners, and it was to bring little audibles, because we, in the meantime, had grown from 100 people to 1,000 people just in Newark, um, and that's a lot of job creation, which then creates small businesses, which then creates jobs for people in the service economy, and Newark Venture Partners has been, has been a huge success bringing companies into Newark. Um, many of them want to plant to be the kinds of companies that have thousands. Uh, which meets up with the local economy. Um, we, when the, when the pandemic crisis hit, we immediately saw that Newark would be hammered by this because of the character of, of the inequality of health care, because of the fact that most working poor people were in the food services economy and the restaurant economy. This was a huge change from like the 1930s when laborers uh, were, were the, the, the paycheck of workers. And so we began a program called Work Work in Kitchens, uh, which was very simple in the sense that we just, we took first, I think, 20, and now it's up to well, more than that, restaurants and basically say, don't go dark. We will buy uh, $10 a piece, uh, hundreds of meals for you every week. And we'll take care of delivering them into people who shouldn't go out or can't go out in a poor city that shouldn't go out as people in multi-generation environments like the housing projects where COVID was absolutely rampant within the population. They shouldn't really go out and see any lines. Um, and, um, and then many people are elderly and can't get out. So we began to deliver it and it created quite a virtuous kind of ecosystem of people. Uh, and it's going to actually cross a million meals uh, that we've served to, um, to, to um, thousands and thousands of people. And with every business we kept, oh, there's um, up to 15 jobs for new workers that were retained. So it, it kind of had a, and, and um, various people put money into it, including the state of New Jersey and others, because if you think about it, it's much better to retain people's jobs than to have them have on, on public assistance. That, uh, that's what I assume is going to unequal recovery uh, happens, particularly for those in, in difficult you know, neighborhoods. But there's been many other things. We figured out how to train incredibly bright and um, outgoing people from the community who didn't have to create into Audible's best-in-class customer care environment. It's very technical to be a customer care person Audible. We have like 96% customer satisfaction. If any of your listeners have ever tried, I hope they've had the same experience, which most people have, um, but we realized that we could actually do changing, changing learning style elements and iterating. And then now huge percentage of the workforce um, 
that are the most successful in New York are from that background, and often people who are in poor Texas and will uh, welfare existence and or, or homeless uh, people who work with government jobs. Um, and that, you know, the idea of unleashing the power of giving people a chance, sort of a mantra that um, played out in, in, in Newark, and those employees who feel it, um, I think they feel like they work in a place that's different, particularly than other tech companies that are centered in, you know, in Manhattan, for instance, which has become, you know, um, such an epicenter of almost bizarre wealth. I mean, I've, been, I've actually said there's been more wealth accumulation in the island of Manhattan in the last 15 years than at any other time here for You know, it's literally just like you know, many of my, my, my kids, uh, you know, in Brooklyn and others, you know, they refer to uh, Manhattan as um, the capital from the Hunger Games. It's kind of a feat, you know, place uh, just filled with the wealth. And here we are in Newark, which is literally 18 minutes away by train. Um, you know, seeing hopefully uh, a, a, an urban comeback that we're proud to be a part of. But um, I've sort of said that I, I prefer that people who work at Audible um, don't look at this as philanthropy, but look at this as the direct, um, the direct connection to addressing, um, you know, inequalities across all as we know, and how all the characteristics of inequality from medical absent wealth creation to social justice disparities and the like. And, you know, I, I do proud of as my, my, you know, later days as at, at Audible, if, um, if people, the only people who work for us are people who kind of got how we want to roll. And there's plenty of other places to work. Well, another example of turning ideas into reality for the good of the world. And this is no ordinary philanthropy. So it's been amazing to talk to you, Don. Um, just one last question, curious about how your father passed away. You were 19, just- uh, yeah, my, father, my father was uh, was just an amazing, and also an entrepreneur uh, in the musical and industry, musical because he made guitars. And uh, um, just a, a wonderful, thoughtful, uh, beloved kind of person. And he just went out with playing tennis. And I, just had a massive heart attack and uh, passed away. But, you know, as a given your medical background, the ironies of it are harsh because it was 1973. It was only months before the TP drugs that keep people alive in the hospital were commercialized. And so, uh, you know, one of those just ironic, sad things that I kind of had to, to, to deal with. But, but I, um, you know, I, uh, I just look back at it as, uh, you know, one of those things where um, it does lead you to philosophy, you know, and, uh, you know, whether it's uh, something as simple as the little the petit prince, you know, the idea that, you know, you celebrate life because somebody as glorious as this and then has the past um, person uh, was in it or other things. But um, I was actually, well, I was asked uh, at a company gathering, like, what's the most Impactful book. I had to say it was the Little Prince after my father died because it gave me some sense of finding ways forward. But whether through, you know, psychological insight or spiritual insight, and I think I've shared with you because of my time in India, I've become really interested in things like Vedanta, which I found to be a really profound underpinning, which a lot of people in America don't really know how deeply it's rooted. You know, all um, things about Hinduism and. Uh, and and Buddhism and other things. So I've become more and more interested in it. But my, my father's death was definitely um, something with me. I mean, my, even with my sisters, it was not, um, you know, it's, it's very traumatic. And my wife and I actually support not audible organizations that try to deal with um, early loss um, because it is a particular um, thing. But I, on the other hand, I know that in 1973, there were pretty much still Victorian ideas about family. And I did write a book about the American family called Home Fires. That's my, my best uh, uh, work of, of nonfiction, which takes a family from the day the father gets home from World War II until into the 90s and explores a real family's journey through the, you know, the suburbanization experience, the counterculture, the spiritual um, 
one of the kids becomes a follower of Satchidananda down in, uh, in the, and, it, and it's real, it's a real story, but it deals with the concept of family as it progressed in the post-war era. Uh, so um, I guess you know, even with lost, these things are, you know, create creativity. And uh, I think I kind of explored through my books, if my, if my father had lived the things I would have asked him because my book about Sears, which is still read in business school, is really about the World War II generation's experience of Heartland Corporations and this transference of battlefield loyalties to corporations. Um, my book, Home Fires, was really about the World War II generation's experience of family. And, uh, and uh, my book about Nike was really about someone a little younger than my father was, but about an entrepreneur, uh, Phil Knight. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. So I think subconsciously I was writing books that were exploring answers I was searching for. Yeah, and, and the loss contributed to your contribution to the world. So very grateful for this conversation and look forward to many more interactions with you and my work with Audible. Very excited about that as well. Um, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. It's an honor to be here, and thank you for all you do. Thank you.